Here on Nature League, we explore the amazingness of life on Earth. Even though I currently live in a landlocked state, some of my favorite life on Earth call the ocean their home. We've created several videos exploring the wonders of the ocean and the things that live there. To start us off, here's a video where I go over some basics and then answer questions related to the Earth's oceans. We filmed Nature League on location in Montana, and if you know U.S. geography, you know that the nearest ocean is a decent distance from here. That said, living a bit inland hasn't stopped me from loving the ocean. The sea has always felt like home to me, and not just because it has sharks. The ocean simply captivates me, and always has. So before this becomes a love letter from me to the sea, let's go through some ocean basics. One of the things that amazes me about the ocean is that it's big. Like, really big, gigantic. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration recently estimated the volume of the ocean to be approximately 1,335,000,000 cubic kilometers. The ocean is so large that it's hard to even conceptualize this kind of size. Not only is the ocean massive, but it's also ancient. The planet Earth is estimated to be about four and a half billion years old. What's crazy is that the Earth's oceans are almost as old as that. At its early stages, the Earth would have been too hot for liquid water. So one possibility as to how the oceans got here is that as the Earth cooled, water vapor condensed into liquid form. Another theory is that ice was delivered from space by comets or meteors and then melted. Either way, the water in the oceans is probably close to four billion years old. All right, so the ocean is really big and really old, but what's happening inside? How do humans interact with it? And who calls it home? There are so many ocean topics we could talk about that I had a hard time picking and choosing for this lesson plan. So instead, I asked around to get an idea of what people would like to know about Earth's oceans. And for the rest of this lesson plan, we're going to mix it up a bit. It's time for an oceans Q&A. Is the fish population decreasing as dramatically as they say? It's hard to talk about global trends for fish, partly because there are so many of them. Scientists estimate that there are over 15,000 species of marine fish. Of those, close to 200 are currently listed as either endangered or critically endangered by the IUCN Red List. Humans typically only affect a small percentage of those thousands of marine fish species. However, the ones we do affect, we tend to affect in major ways. What kind of niche ecology is in the deep sea? A niche Niche can be broadly defined as a species' functional role in an ecosystem. Basically, different species do different things, and the general patterns seen in the deep sea are similar to those elsewhere on Earth. However, there are some interesting exceptions. The deepest parts of the ocean don't receive any sunlight, so some niches are occupied a bit differently than we're used to. On land and in shallow seas, the role of primary producer in an ecosystem is some kind of plant. However, without sunlight, the lowest levels of the food chain in the deep sea have to get their energy from somewhere else. Even though there's no sunlight, scientists estimate that there are over 17,000 marine species living in the deep sea. It turns out that some of these creatures can create their own forms of energy from chemicals in the water, in a process called chemosynthesis. For example, chemosynthetic bacteria are the base of most deep ocean ecosystems, and they actually use sulfur from hydrothermal vents to form usable energy. What's the deal with giant squids? What is the deal with giant squids? For one, they are real. Even though they've appeared in some famous works of fiction, giant squids are totally a non-fictional thing. The giant squid is the largest invertebrate on Earth. Amazingly, though, we know very little about them, and most of that knowledge has come from dead individuals that have floated up from the deep sea. So let's break down the giant thing. While they may not live up to the leviathan size depicted in mythology and fiction, giant squids are still pretty, well, giant. They can grow up to 13 meters long and catch prey using two feeding tentacles up to 10 meters away. Also, they have the largest animal eyes on Earth. Each one is about a foot in diameter. What are we doing about the pollution in our oceans? At this point, plastics are the largest pollutants in the ocean when it comes to human-made products. Attention has been increasingly drawn to the issue, however, and just last year at the United Nations Environmental Assembly, more than 200 nations approved a resolution to eliminate ocean plastic pollution. While while this isn't legally binding, some countries have put legal restrictions in place. Countries like Australia, Kenya, Chile, and the UK have either banned or imposed significant fines on plastic grocery bags. How do ocean currents affect the world? How don't ocean currents affect the world? Ocean currents work sort of like global conveyor belts, moving water, nutrients, and organisms all around. What's more, the ocean absorbs the majority of the sun's radiation, meaning that the oceans are almost like gigantic solar panels. When water heats 
heats up enough, it evaporates, meaning the ocean water actually affects the temperature, humidity, and weather patterns on land. However, way more solar radiation hits the equators than the poles of the Earth. If there weren't any ocean currents, the heat and energy absorbed at the equator wouldn't get moved around to other places. This would result in the equator being way hotter and the poles being way colder. So while ocean water affects local weather patterns, ocean currents actually affect global climate. How deep in the sea have humans gone? To date, only three humans have gone to the deepest part of the Mariana Trench, which is the deepest known part of the ocean. That is insane to think about. Like, more people have been to the moon than to the deepest part of the ocean. In 2010, scientists measured the max depth of this trench to be approximately 10,994 meters, or 36,070 feet deep. As in, if you turn Mount Everest upside down, the top would still be a few kilometers from the bottom. That is incredible. Have they found any fun new critters recently? All the time. In 2018, marine research scientists discovered an entirely new ocean zone that we didn't know about. Within that zone, the team found more than 100 new species previously unknown to science. What's insane is that this new ocean zone isn't super deep or hidden. It's actually between 130 and 300 meters deep and located in the Caribbean. The team found new species like tanaids, which are super tiny crustaceans, dozens of new algae species, and even a black wire coral. If an entirely new biological community was just found in shallow-ish, commonly explored regions, just imagine what we don't know about the rest of the ocean. Are deep sea creatures basically aliens? This is actually something I think about a lot. Whenever I watch science fiction movies with aliens, I can't help but think of Vampirotuthis, or the vampire squid. If this isn't a science fiction alien, then I do not know what is. The deepest parts of the ocean, the parts inside of trenches in the bottom of the sea, are actually referred to as the Hadal Zone. There's a wild word for you. Hadal actually comes from the name Hades, the Greek god of the underworld. Even the scientific words we have for the deep ocean have a mythological history, so why not consider them aliens? If nothing else, creatures from the deep ocean definitely deserve some royalties for sci-fi costume design. Where are the sunken fortunes? What, you think I got this for fun? Tell me more about bioluminescence. Bioluminescence is when organisms emit light using a special biochemical reaction. While we do see examples of this on land, like fireflies, this phenomenon is most commonly seen in the oceans. Most people think of deep sea creatures when bioluminescence is mentioned. However, species throughout the Earth's oceans are capable of this feat. You'll find bioluminescent species at the top of the water column, at the bottom of the ocean, right near the beach, or even in the middle of the ocean, thousands of kilometers from land. And when you think about how big the deep ocean is, and how many species exist there, an interesting thought comes to mind. It's possible that bioluminescence is the most common form of communication on Earth. Can the oceans be harnessed to reverse climate change? What's an exact procedure? Exact procedure is asking a bit much, but there are certainly some incredible ideas on the table at present. Geoengineering refers to large-scale human intervention in Earth systems to do things like combat climate change. Because the ocean is so integral to global climate and can capture greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, some of the most prominent geoengineering ideas involve the ocean. One of these is called ocean fertilization. Here's how it works. Cytoplankton take in the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide to do photosynthesis. When they die, the carbon dioxide is inside of them and goes down to the bottom of the ocean instead of being in the atmosphere, contributing to global warming. Ocean fertilization aims to boost the populations of phytoplankton, specifically by jacking up the ocean's iron content. Phytoplankton require iron to grow, so the idea is that doping the oceans with iron could boost their populations. While ideas like this are cool, the issue is that we don't fully understand the potential consequences. In fact, large-scale ocean fertilization is actually banned by an international treaty at present, so it'll be some time before this actually happens, if at all. The ocean is crazy and beautiful and complex and, most incredibly, is something we barely even know about. But there are some things we've figured out, and we'll be exploring these ocean components and themes throughout the month. Yes, in case you were wondering, I did already own that shark onesie, and yes, you'll certainly be seeing it again on Nature League. Despite the oceans taking up the vast majority of space on Earth, there's so much we don't know about it. Everyone has a different level of ocean knowledge, and we took it to the streets for a field trip of ocean trivia. What percentage of the ocean do you think humans have explored? You guys can collaborate, see if you can come up with I think something. It's uh, less than 1%, I heard. What? What would your I guess, guess be? I was gonna say like 70%. I would guess 9%. 20, 25%? My guess is 40%. 5%. Oh, isn't it like 2%? 
Look at you. Yeah, it's crazy low. Okay, so is what? Yeah, it's right, it's right okay. around there. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. How do tides work? So like, why does the ocean have tides? It's the moon. The moon. The moon. I think that there's like a gravitational pull, isn't there with uh, yeah. like solar system? I went to Hawaii one time and I realized that on full moons, um, the tides go out and then they come back in and all the jellyfish and sharks come in. Hello. What are you guys doing? Totally randomly, we have Callie Moore here. You might know her from Eons. Callie works on the awesome complexity channel Eons with PBS Digital Studios. Where does the salt in seawater come from? The continent? Bobcat tears. Broken down minerals over time or rocks over time. Isn't it like runoff? Like, I mean, it, like mineral runoff from like fresh water that eventually made it into the ocean and over millions of years it's solidified? Over millions of years, yeah. Basically like erosion of other right. rocks and pieces. Yeah, totally. What kind of an animal is a whale? Mammal, fish, plant, reptile? Because it, it nurses well, its I think young. it's a mammal. I'll go with mammal. It's a mammal. It is a mammal. <laughs> Shut your mouth. No way. <laughs> yeah. Could you name an environmental problem that is affecting the oceans here, like around the United States? Yes, the use of plastic bottles. I would say garbage in the ocean. Besides climate change, plastic production. Use of fertilizers. Coral bleaching, right? It's in the it's South South Florida is having trouble with coral bleaching. Probably the Pacific garbage heap is like a pretty pertinent one. Definitely. I, I think that I heard that it was like the size of Texas floating around out there. The one that's coming to mind the most is just like the big like trash islands in the middle of the ocean. Totally. There's just like a lot around being conscientious about our plastic usage and like our plastic right. waste and where that goes and it just goes right into the ocean and that hurts animals and yeah our friends what can you tell me about ocean acidification I've heard of both those words <laughs> it's a big issue in Australia right like on ah, in the yeah. coral reefs I think it's it's gonna lead to the destruction of all coral reef in like 15 years there's pollution that is acidifying the ocean um, to the point where it is probably unhealthy for life to exist ocean acidification is when you get too much co2 absorbed in your ocean and that decreases the ph so it makes it more acidic which is super bad for like everything that makes a calcium carbonate shell which is like shells and Definitely shells, uh, yeah. And, and, and coral. And coral, yeah, stresses <laughs> Some them out. species of coral, yeah, yes. If you could learn anything about the ocean, about any topic, what would you want to know more about? Octopi. Climate change impact on the ocean. I would ask, how deep is it? I like the, like, spooky, dark, unexplored yes. depth stuff. Creatures that live in, like, the deep ocean. I really love sea lions, and I would love to learn more about them and their habitats. Probably cold water, deep sea reefs. I would also like to know if there's any adverse effects by desalination. Ooh, that's like a really good point. you're creating more fresh water in and take like taking how, away what's yeah, the yeah, balance yeah what's the balance i want to explore the other 98 percent let's do it yeah that's like that's tomorrow I mean. yeah are like you tomorrow. free yeah yeah we'll go like some <laughs> deep zizu style yeah <gasps> it's my favorite movie <laughs> since i'm such a shark fangirl i was wondering how many types of sharks people could name uh the great white shark nice hammerhead awesome buller shark is that a thing? Bull shark, Okay, yes. maybe that's what I was thinking. So San Jose. San yeah. Jose. <laughs> Goblin. Whale shark? Yeah. Is sand shark a thing? There's a sand tiger shark. Yeah. Sand tiger shark? Oh, tiger shark. Tiger there. shark? <laughs> no sand. Oh, I helped. Black tip. Basking. The one with the weird long tail. The thresher the shark. Thresher sharks. Is there such thing as like a blue shark or something like yes. that? Yes. At this point, you could just guess adjectives and things right, and yeah, put it in front probably... of shark, right? <laughs> nerf shark. Nerf shark. <laughs> Look at that. Yes. <laughs> Baby shark? There are tiny A baby shark. <laughs> <laughs> the illustrious and rare baby shark. <laughs> what is your favorite ocean creature? I like dolphins. I like sharks. Sea lions. Sea otter. I like sea cucumbers a lot. Anything that bioluminesces. A whale. I just love whales. And like, yeah. that's me and my sister really love whales. Or manatees. Manatees are beautiful. A blue whale or a narwhal. And now a word. Not from our sponsors, but from the dictionary. Welcome to this month's Wild Word. Once a month on Nature League, we'll look at the etymology or origin and history of words related to nature. This month's theme is oceans, and this month's Wild Word is one of the most beloved ocean species out there. That word is dolphin. Yep. Most everyone knows and loves dolphins, but the origin of the word dolphin is lesser known. Dolphin comes to us from ancient Greek, though it took quite a few steps along the way and transitioned between several languages. Over time, the English took dolphin from French, which took it from Latin, which took it from Greek. In Greek, the word was delphis, and that word literally meant dolphin. 
that charismatic marine mammal we're familiar with. But the story doesn't stop at the Greek word Delphis. Most etymological accounts point to the ancient Greek word Delphus as the original source. And that word, Delphus, means womb. Now, at first glance, this connection seems pretty odd. What's even more interesting is that there really isn't a single agreed upon reason that this connection was made in the first place. Here are some possibilities. It's possible that something about a dolphin's appearance reminded the ancient Greeks of a womb either in shape or some other aspect. However, I'm not quite buying this possibility. Another possibility is that the womb connection had to do with dolphins giving live birth, which is seldom seen in marine life. Perhaps people long ago were paying respect to the mammalian nature of these ocean creatures when they named them after something that carries a fetus. Yet another explanation has to do with the Greek god Apollo. Now, Apollo was typically associated with dolphins and appeared alongside these creatures in several myths. The famous temple of Delphi was dedicated to Apollo, and Homer wrote a famous hymn about how this came to be. The myth goes like this. Apollo went around searching for a place to set up his oracle and found a suitable spot near Mount Parnassus. After setting up his sanctuary, Apollo needed some attendance. He found a ship carrying men from Crete and scared them into worshiping him by jumping on board in the shape of a dolphin. This feat, and the following gain thereafter, is why the temple was named Delphi according to Homer. While this tale is pretty fun, it leaves a few things out, as per any myth. At the location in question, there was originally a group of worshippers dedicated to the Earth Mother Gaia, who symbolized fertility, among other things. It's totally possible that the location of the temple was originally named Delphi, because of the worship of a goddess connected to the womb. Eventually, people worshipping Apollo took over the space, kept the name, and then... Well, who knows how dolphins came into it? The thing is, dolphins and humans have interacted for so long in human history that the origin of the word simply goes back too far to really know why there's a connection between the word for dolphin and the word for womb. So while a formal definition of dolphin is a small gregarious toothed whale that typically has a beak-like snout and a curved fin on the back, dolphin comes to us, for whatever reason, from a word meaning womb. And that is pretty wild. While Montana might not be full of ocean experts, the issue of ocean literacy is actually one that affects the entire United States. Public survey reports over the past 10 years have uncovered a surprising lack of knowledge concerning the Earth's oceans, even in people who live on the coast. For instance, back in 2009, an extensive survey effort revealed that 35% of American adults polled couldn't name a single ocean-related issue affecting the United States, meaning that the American public knew more about topics like college football and the Academy Awards than the oceans. The thing is, Oceans are incredibly important to life on Earth, including to us, and knowledge is power. So here on Nature League, we'll be exploring this theme for the rest of the month. One of the hottest, pun intended, scientific articles of 2018 had to do with estimating the heating of the oceans. This paper also got a lot of attention because the authors made a calculation error in their estimate. In a format called Denatured, I broke down the science behind this peer-reviewed journal article and the drama that unfolded with the calculation errors. On Nature League, we spend the third week of each month exploring a current trending article from the peer-reviewed literature. Scientific information isn't just for scientists, it's for everyone. It just requires a bit of a breakdown. For this month's Denatured segment, we're going to look at an article released in November 2018 in the journal Nature. In this month's lesson plan and field trip, we touched on the relationship between the ocean and the Earth's climate. One part of this relationship is that the ocean is one of the biggest storage centers of carbon on Earth. And aside from trapping carbon, the ocean also traps heat, or thermal energy. In fact, the ocean takes up close to 90% of the excess energy produced as Earth warms over time. But measuring the heat content of the ocean is tricky to say the least. In the past, total heat content was estimated by combining and analyzing tons of ocean temperature spot measurements. A sensor network dubbed Argo has been taking these measurements during recent decades and expanded coverage in 2007. Even though the Argo network is extensive, the ocean is massive, and there are lots of gaps in coverage. In addition to gaps, temperature-based estimates like these can only sample the top half of the ocean. These issues result in estimated warming trends with uncertainties up to 25 to 50 percent. But what's a little uncertainty in scientific measurements? Being off about ocean temperatures isn't that bad. 
right? Uncertainty is part of any field of study, but when it comes to climate science and modeling, there are massive consequences on the line. Just think, international treaties and plans like the Paris Agreement are based on measurements that include ocean temperatures, and we haven't had the most accurate game plan in place. That is, until now. In this paper entitled, Quantification of Ocean Heat Uptake from Changes in Atmospheric Oxygen and Carbon Dioxide Composition, scientists have proposed a revolutionary new way to measure the heat content of the ocean, and and their results point to some brand new and far-reaching conclusions about Earth's climate. In this particular study, the researchers present a brand new method based on the abundances of gases in the atmosphere and how they change over time. It goes something like this. Gases are affected by temperature, and how much a gas dissolves in seawater depends on this factor. When the ocean warms, oxygen and carbon dioxide gas doesn't dissolve as much in the water, so the ocean loses gas. This loss of gas can be measured by comparing against the gains of gas in the atmosphere. Instead of relying on temperature measurements, the team measured the concentration of atmospheric oxygen and carbon dioxide in a new metric called Atmospheric Potential Oxygen, or APO. What's great is that we have highly precise atmospheric oxygen measurements going back to 1991 and back to 1958 for carbon dioxide, meaning this new method has almost three decades worth of quality data to use. Gases move around a lot, though, and it's hard to pinpoint whether the change in atmospheric oxygen and carbon dioxide was in response to processes in the ocean versus somewhere else. However, the team used ocean-specific ratios of gases to make the APO in sensitive to gas exchanges on the land. So let's dig into their APO measurement for a bit. In order to trace the changes in different gases in the atmosphere, the team first got something called the APO observed. And they got this data called atmospheric potential oxygen, that's the APO, from the Scripps Institute. The thing is, this observed APO was actually made up of several different sources of gases and changes with those gases. So the first one that we can look at has to do with the change in atmospheric potential oxygen, but due to climate. And these are things that are happening in the ocean specifically due to warming that then create changes. So in the ocean, there are processes that lead to warming and this winds up feeding into the changes in APO due to climate. The second piece of this equation is called APO due to anthropogenic carbon. I've drawn a little human here and we're gonna have that guy stand in for anthropogenic, just meaning caused by humans. The thing is the ocean actually takes in a ton of carbon from human activities. And so the second piece accounts for the fact that there is carbon and other gases coming in due to different activities of humans. This third piece here, I've labeled aerosols, but it actually has to do with human-produced aerosols. These are just pieces in the air of particles that actually wind up helping with fertilization. So imagine different things running off into the ocean. What that does is it actually lets small organisms in the ocean have a higher rate of photosynthesis, so they're more productive. And so that photosynthesis, when it's added to those aerosols, actually winds up contributing up into this equation. The last component in this equation for the observed APO has to do with fossil fuels, so industry and also cement production. And that winds up taking APO out of the atmosphere. And so this has the arrow going down. So this is the general schematic that the research scientists actually use in their paper in one of their figures. I've just drawn it here so that we could kind of look at it and see how they then derived the next step. So we have all these pieces that went into the APO observed, but the thing they were actually interested in was the fact that there was this climate variable here that really had a lot to do with warming happening in the ocean. So it turns out the APO climate variable was a really good way to track ocean warming trends. So last step was to get that guy alone. And that just meant a little bit of algebra. So they derived the final equation a little bit like this. That is how they tracked warming. Okay, actually, nope, there's supposed to be an arrow here, and let's just pretend that that was there the whole time. Mm -hmm. Everything got moved over, isolated this, you saw nothing. 
So overall, the team came up with a new and more precise way to measure ocean warming. But they didn't stop there. They actually used this new method to obtain an estimate. Here's what they found. The world's oceans absorbed more than 13 zeta joules of heat energy each year between 1991 and 2016. A joule is a unit of energy, and that prefix zeta means there are 21 zeros. In other words, that means the oceans are taking in about 150 times more energy each year than what humans produce each year as electricity. So now for some perspective. This estimate is 60% higher than the previous temperature-based estimate that's been used up until now. Countries are currently working toward keeping the rise in global temperatures under 2 degrees Celsius. Staying under a 2 degree rise requires some budgeting, particularly of carbon emissions. However, with this new data, the carbon dioxide emission budget we've calculated needs to be reduced another 25% in order to reach that goal. At the time of releasing this episode, this paper has only been out for a couple of weeks. However, it has taken the climate science community and general public by storm. Here's why I think this article is making the rounds. Upgrades to previously faulty methodologies always make a big splash, especially when so much hinges on them. Imagine taking temperatures with a thermometer that had the wrong number spacing on it. The whole time you'd used it, you weren't picking up any kind of fever at all. So when you finally got a thermometer that worked, you'd be like, oh. There it is. That's sort of what happened here. Ocean warming trends have been based on less than ideal methodologies, and that means our climate change estimates and legislature about carbon emissions have been based on faulty measurements. Because of that, this update on ocean temperature could have massive global consequences. Keep in mind that ocean warming measurements have been used in the standard assessment report for global climate change by the leading authority on the subject, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. In their fifth and most recent assessment report, the IPCC used ocean warming estimates that were way lower than what was found here. This means that when the IPCC and participating countries set their carbon emission legislations, they were being overly optimistic about just how much heat the oceans are absorbing. The night before we were scheduled to upload this denatured episode, I got a news alert about an error found in this particular article. Here's what happened. The article was published in Nature, one of, if not the most prestigious scientific journals on Earth. On November 6th, less than a week later, an independent climate scientist named Nick Lewis posted an informal review of the paper on a blog. In his blog post, he recalculates the trends reported in the Nature article and shows that there were errors in the estimation of the change in APO due to climate and major miscalculations in the uncertainty reported for the results. Here's what happened next. The authors got a hold of this blog post and immediately considered Lewis's critiques and corrections. On November 9th, co-author Ralph Keeling released a statement saying that the authors were looking into the errors brought up by Lewis and that they take full responsibility for the mistakes. By November 14th, the story of these errors had spread throughout global media outlets, including the news article that alerted me. So where does all of this leave us? Overall, a few things still stand true. For instance, the new methodology for measuring warming is still valid as well as the insights they found regarding the connections between the ocean and atmosphere. Also, the authors note in their news release that their calculations of overall heat uptake by the oceans are still mostly accurate. The issue is with the margin of error. The redone calculations show that the uncertainty is much larger than they thought, meaning this new method at present has similar uncertainty to previous methods. So yes, the ocean is taking in massive amounts of energy. And yes, the ocean is warming. And yes, the emissions guidelines set by the IPCC might need to be adjusted in the future. But does this mean that scientists have been lying to us about climate change trends as some outlets are interpreting it? Absolutely not. It just means that right now we are seeing the process of science in action. Even though errors weren't found throughout the official peer review process, peer review continued to happen even after publication, in the form of a blog post, no less. Science isn't a bunch of facts. Science is a process. And that process just so happens to include a series of trial, error, calculations, mistakes, recalculations, and review. The moral of this story? We should keep an open and skeptical mind about new scientific results while respecting and welcoming outside perspectives. We couldn't complete the theme of oceans without letting my friend Adrian ask me a question about this realm of Earth. In this installment of From A to B, Adrian asked me about how humans came up with tales about sea monsters like the Kraken. So all over the world there are stories of terrible sea creatures like the Kraken, 
uh, giant whales that attack ships. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you think that those stories came from actual sightings? Like before we started totally just pillaging the ocean for all of its resources, do you think that there were giant squid that would actually come to the surface of the ocean and go after ships? Do you think that there were whales large enough that had the right mindset to attack uh, whaling vessels? Like, was that a thing? Is there any chance that those were based in reality? I think that those old kind of uh, seafaring tales are similar probably to a lot of mythology, which came from somewhere. So these uh, these monsters or even gods or myths are all came from ideas already established either within the culture or actually in, you know, Nature. outside. Yeah, uh, like not inside the house, but somewhere else, some mm -hmm. non-human organism. Yeah. So I think it's totally reasonable to think that all of that started with an actual creature. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think what you're then up against is A, like exaggeration, hyperbole, and the psychology that goes into storytelling when you get back home, right? Of like that thing we saw sure. that was 80 meters long. And they're like, dude, it was like six feet. <laughs> like stop making stuff up. So I think when it was just tales being told, like through oral tradition and without a photo or even like video footage, it was really easy for things to get maybe a little bit out of hand or exaggerated. Sure. So I think it's a mixture of that and also with the ocean, some of those species, in fact, a lot of them are existing in places that we're never actually going to, going to go or see. So it's not like, you know, in a submarine dive, then you're seeing something like a giant squid, something that is lower down, mm -hmm. right? In order for these uh, sailing or, you know, boating people to have seen these, these organisms they claim to have seen, they would have had to come to the surface. Exactly. So what are some reasons why a deep sea creature would come to the surface? That's where the food is, or that's where you mate. So some, yeah, just like some like, basic necessity. Yeah. Um, what about a non-living reason? I'm thinking about the fact that when things die and get washed ashore, that's some of the ways we've seen even giant squids, like some of the specimens to date are because you had something die and I rise up or get washed Okay, but shore. when anything that big dies at the top of the, you know, water, it gets eaten, right? I mean, yeah, some giant squid have washed ashore, but like... Right. Are you telling me that these boat people... <laughs> boat people? people. <laughs> these boat people... Are you telling me that they just invented stories of them attacking ships? You're saying, are you, you're saying that there's no way that something like a giant squid would have ever come to the surface? I'm saying I think there's the possibility of some of these myths having started from a dead specimen, in which case that gets iffy, but there are reasons why an animal might come to the surface or even act aggressively. Well, and I'm not ruling that out. My, you know, my thought behind it might be that before the boat people started eating all the fish and killing all the whales, I mean, isn't it possible that the ocean was a pretty different ecosystem before we stepped in and started messing with the whole thing. Is it possible that there was a breed of giant squid that was like on the surface and, you know, or closer to the surface and that's just what they did? Yes and no. I think for something that large to exist, it needs a lot of space. And that space is not gonna come from the shallow type of seas where you um, see a lot of like fishing and other things of depletion. It would be typically in a larger, maybe open ocean or even bent something more benthic. So that would- Benthic. Benthic, so the benthic zone is a deeper zone of ocean. So uh, we're not talking like coastal uh, regions, which is where you have a lot more of that productivity like coral reefs and when you think about all, right. all the, you know, so ton the of fish. So the deep ocean. Yeah, so maybe some deeper ocean potentially is more of a home to something so large that needs that much space. Now the trade-off is like space and then resources because if you're in some open, vast kind of deep ocean, mm -hmm. then what are you eating? And of course that comes... Sperm whales. Squid don't eat sperm whales. How do we know? Sperm whales and giant squid are mortal enemies. We know this. You know what's interesting is that you sound like you're making it up, like out of a book or maybe... But I'm not. Do you see something on Facebook? I don't know. Is it a... <laughs> I'm not a fake news propagator. No, but you know what's cool is that we have actually uh, found um, evidence of struggle between both uh, squid and sperm whales on their skin. So like mm -hmm. the bite, bite marks yeah. from a toothed whale and then also... Uh, well, that's one way to describe it. Yeah. <laughs> 
just like that on the sperm whale. <laughs> Mortal enemies, the uh, a as you say, the giant yeah. squid and sperm whale. But they are. We know that for a fact that sperm rail whales do this thing where they're like, oh, we're going to chill up here where it's warm and there's air. And then they dive deep, deep down, and then they hang out there for a while. And then they come back up and they've got battle scars. Yeah, I mean, battle scars is like a really human. They absolutely do battle. They absolutely do battle. So that's, I mean, for all you know, they're just like, it's like a high five gone wrong. Like, you don't know that it's an antagonistic interaction. Yes, we do, because we you found giant know. squid remains in the stomach of sperm whales. But that could have been an, an agreeable a, a sacrifice. If Aztecs gave hearts up, like this, I'm just saying, we can't assume if we don't see it to be a lot are happening. You really, are you really going to go on the record and say that we don't know that sperm whales eat giant squid? Mortal enemies and battle wounds is a no. Potential predation is a yeah. There's a difference. There's a difference. Okay, well, my hypothesis is <laughs> that as we hunted the whales, yep. the gigantic whales, the squids that were near the surface uh, didn't have as much food to eat because they would just, my guess is they'd just gang up on on these whales because uh, we know that squid sometimes hunt in pack. The Humboldt squid hunts in lots of packs. You, I... sir, steal my heart. Oh, I know. Know about Humboldt squids, my I know. gosh. They hunt in packs and uh, what about giant squid could just hunt in packs, take down one big whale and as the whales disappeared, the only the squid had to dive deep down to eat. Yeah, but right? I mean, but that's only thinking about two species. And the thing with any ecosystem or any large group of multiple species is that it's multiple species all interacting on the landscape. So to think that there'd be a direct causation just between two is a little bit tricky because there's so much going on. And in oceans, nutrients are cycling. There's changes in all kinds of things like atmospheric gases uh, concentration, then temperature, the uh, seasonal flow of different, uh, not only nutrients, but like the water currents themselves. Like, there's just so much going on that I think it'd be hard to ever really give evidence for like a one-to-one. -one. Okay. But I do think it's fair to say there's something special about these two species when it comes to human psychology and what makes us afraid, right? With the giant squid. So yeah. what the kraken is based on. Like let's let's think like basic human fear. We're talking about something that not only is massive, yeah. right? But it looks so different than ourselves. Right. And the eye, like how big the eye is, is there's something so alien about that that I think is one of those like we've we've based science fiction and 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 like actual, you know, alien monsters off mm -hmm. of this idea. So there's something there's something there. But what about sperm whales? They are these giant predaceous things and yeah. at least a couple of times in history you had a sperm whale say see that boat i'm gonna wreck that boat right there that one. do you think that at some point when people when boat people were first starting to populate the world that whales were big enough to make that happen absolutely the whales now i mean we don't you don't even have to think back and be like did there used to be a species like think about a sperm whale right now they are the largest toothed predator on earth to be the biggest of something but not only that the biggest of something with teeth that is a predator and they have the largest brain on earth there's something about that for so, so large of a brain or head especially mm -hmm. when we consider that to be our kind of prized thing so yes. not only are you massive you have teeth you are absolutely a, a predator and like and eat meat but you also have a seemingly massive brain i feel like anything like that would spur fear absolutely in and the that's hearts of why it's people. my ideal date ideal date <laughs> you're massive you've got sharp teeth <laughs> okay you're absolutely a predator you have a gigantic brain i would say that at least with the giant squid and the sperm whale there's a there's a fair point in terms of the fear and then the stories that may have abounded now individual motivations we can never say because we can't say what another creature is thinking or, or planning to do and why, right? But I think uh, I think it's a fair enough kind of a fear when it comes to something that large that can inspire uh, right. those myths and, and other legends. So for the record, you think that there were giant animals of, of legend of that kind of size prowling the ocean at one point? There are right now is my argument. I'd say the giant squid, which is a real species, and the mm -hmm. sperm whale right now, which is a real species, absolutely both exist. And I think it's just that with us 
uh, with humans having learned a little bit more about it, maybe technology being different with boats, we're not necessar necessarily afraid of that sperm whale is going to wreck my wooden ship, right? It's a, it's a different situation. Right. But not only <clears throat> did they exist, they do exist. And on top of that, like, they're vulnerable. And the sperm whale is listed as, I believe, as vulnerable on the red list. So they might be in more danger than us. So maybe think if, about that. Who's the monster? If only we hadn't wiped out the civilization of boat people. Think of all the information we could have exchanged together. I really do love the ocean. And it was awesome to learn a little bit more about it throughout the creations of these ocean videos here on Nature League. Thanks so much for watching. And if you'd like to keep going on Life on Earth adventures with us here on Nature League, make sure to go to youtube.com slash nature league, subscribe and share. Hey guys, we now have a Nature League pen on DFTBA.com. Click on the link in the description below to get yours.